Good morning, I'm Steve Scully with the Bipartisan Policy Center, and we welcome you to what is a very important and timely conversation on the developing situation in Afghanistan. This in advance of what likely will be a lot of questions from members of Congress as the House returns next week. And so in partnership with Honor Action, we have put together four members of Congress, all veterans, two Democrats and two Republicans, to have that conversation. You know, it was Senator Arthur Vandenberg who famously said that politics stops at the water's edge. But this clearly is both a foreign policy challenge and a domestic challenge for the Biden administration, as well as those 10 to 15,000 Americans who are still in Afghanistan. And of course, a nearly 20 year conflict at a price tag of well over 2,000 American casualties and the, the, the price tag in financial terms of well over $2 trillion. And so with that, four members of Congress, all veterans serving in Iraq and or in Afghanistan, and all members of key House committees, including Homeland Security, Foreign Affairs, and Armed Services. I want to welcome, joining us from New York, is Rai Barkat. He is also a Marine veteran, and he is the co-founder and CEO of With Honor Action. He will lead the conversation, and then in about a half hour, we will take your questions in the chat room. We welcome your questions and comments for the latter part of the program. But first, I want to turn it to Rai. Thank you for your help and thank you for partnering with the Bipartisan Policy Center in this very timely, important conversation. Thanks, Steve, and welcome everybody that's on the call. We have key stakeholders from the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, with honor and about 20 members from the, the press. We welcome you and we appreciate you being able to convene uh, to discuss what is one of the uh, greater humanitarian crises of our time. Uh, with Honor Action is an organization that I co-founded with other veterans. We work to uh, help fix uh, polarization and dysfunction in Congress by electing, by, by supporting uh, and working alongside principled veterans from both parties in the U.S. House. Uh, we're delighted to have four veterans uh, joining us who have been working this issue, specifically the issue of getting our Afghan interpreters and allies uh, to safety. And, uh, and this, has been, this was identified uh, for a long time, uh, and the organization's been working on it uh, aggressively over the last five to six months. Uh, needless to say, we are all just stunned by the events that have transpired, and, and uh, as most veterans are, we're focused on finding a solution, and finding a solution that is truly bipartisan. Uh, one of the most bipartisan votes in Congress occurred uh, thanks to uh, this group, uh, including um, uh, uh, many other members as well that are not veterans. Uh, the one of most bipartisan votes, uh, over 400 votes for the Allies Act to help reduce bureaucracy to the SIV process, included emergency funding, essentially a call for evacuation. Um, and that, that, only, that occurred a, a number of weeks ago. What I'd like to do is first um, turn to uh, Congressman Don Bacon, who is a co-founder of the Four Country Caucus. The Four Country Caucus consists of 25 members of Congress, uh, Republicans and Democrats, and Don uh, co-founded the Four Country Caucus last uh, Congress, the 116th Congress. Um, so Congressman Bacon, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, kicking us off with uh, just what is the Four Country Caucus and why is it important uh, not only for this immediate issue, but for larger ones. And I should just note that Congressman Bacon is a retired uh, Air Force general. Um, and so, uh, Congressman, thank you for, for all your leadership. Hey, thank you, Ryan. And I want to also thank the Bipartisan Policy uh, Center. You, you guys are great. I've been a member or worked with uh, the BPC, and uh, it has been a pleasure to be the original co chair, the Republic, first Republican co-chair of the Four Country Caucus. Uh, I did serve 30 years. Uh, I did fly uh, ISR and electronic warfare type missions over Afghanistan. I spent some time in Kandahar, Herat, Bagram, and, and uh, Kabul. And uh, so have, have some back, good background on Afghanistan itself. Uh, when I got elected in the 115th Congress, uh, along with Jimmy Panetta, uh, it became quite, quite apparent that there wasn't a lot of bipartisan uh, work being done that, you know, where people are running for, uh, on the left side or the right side. There wasn't a lot of trying to find solutions in the middle uh, or, or consensus building. And uh, so in the 116th Congress, uh, we were able to put together a team of veterans 
uh, that want to work together, find areas of consensus. We don't want to compromise our values, but there are areas that we can agree on. That's what we should focus on uh, so the country moves forward. So we originally put together 10 Republicans and 10 Democrats. We've subsequently grown that uh, to be a larger uh, caucus, and uh, but was uh, initially a group of 20. And some of the things we looked at at first, what was their bipartisan scores uh, from the Luger Index or from the Georgetown uh, study that sort of gauges people's uh, bipartisan uh, spirit. And so most of the folks we have here are rate very high on that index, but also it comes with a pledge that you will campaign against each other uh, in, in campaigns. So uh, it comes with that commitment that we'll uh, work together and not throw each other under the bus uh, during the political season. Uh, we know how the, how it works when you're, when you campaign against the one of your colleagues, it doesn't lend itself to good bipartisan work after the election. And so that was our original plan. We, had some early wins. We had wins on Gold Star legislation. We had some wins on uh, veterans bills. And I would say we had a wins with Jason Crow's uh, bill a year ago, and he's gonna talk more about this, but as a group, we agreed that we shouldn't withdraw our troops out of Afghanistan unless certain conditions were met. And we could see that, that we, we were prescient in that you just, if you pull your, your troops without certain conditions being met, you're gonna have a failure. And that's what we've seen today. And uh, so we voted on that over 13 months ago, and it came out of this uh, four country caucus. So, uh, with that, uh, you know, we I passed the baton on uh, to uh, we all the original co chairs passed on the baton, but I'm still proud to be a member and an active participant in that. And, and it's great working up with Rye and the entire team. So, Rye, with that, I, I yield, yield it back to you. Thanks, uh, Congressman Bacon from uh, Nebraska's second. Uh, one of the really important programs that the Bipartisan Policy Center. Uh, has is a is a congressional exchange with members and Congressman Bacon entered with uh, Congressman Salud Carbajal, who's a member of the Four Country Caucus, and they had a bipartisan policy exchange in I believe their first year in Congress and really formed a uh, an important friendship. And those in friendships fact, we were the first ones. <laughs> the first ones. We were the, very, we were the first ones to complete the uh, program. <laughs> Just terrific. Well, well, Congressman Jason Crow upped the ante a little bit by uh, going out of out all the way to uh, the beaches of Normandy and jumping out of a perfectly good airplane with his counterpart, Car Congressman Mike, not on this call, but has also been very involved with uh, the Four Country Caucus and the Honoring Our Promises task force that Congressman Crow set up. Congressman Crow is an Army Ranger. He served in the 82nd Airborne, which of course we're hearing a lot about as is on the boots on the ground now at the, the Kabul airfields and um, and has has played a critical leadership role in uh, in working this issue. Uh, Congressman Crow, if you, if you could maybe um, just kick us off with the uh, an abbreviated timeline of what has transpired, um, particularly over the last four months on this issue, and then and then maybe we can uh, you know jump to the present and um, and what needs to what needs to happen to, to fix a very difficult situation. Congressman? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Ray Barcott, and with Honor Action, and, and thank you to Steve Scully and the Bipartisan uh, Policy Center. Uh, appreciate um, your partnership uh, and, and the collaborations that we've had over the last three years of my time in Congress, and of course to my uh, good friends, Peter Meyer, Don Bacon, and Kai Kahaley, uh, not just members of Congress, but my fellow veterans and people that are committed to this notion that um, we can uh, focus on those areas where we do agree. We don't have to beat each other up all the time. Uh, we can find some progress in areas of collaboration. And one of those biggest ones has been on the issue of uh, our, um, our partners, our allies, uh, not just Afghanistan, which of course is the focus of um, uh, this call uh, and many of our efforts uh, of late, uh, but more generally the idea that uh, a global engagement, our partnerships and our alliances matter, uh, that uh, a, a world with an American leadership matters, and we are better off when we lead uh, with a group and with our, our, our morals and our values. And that brings us to Afghanistan. Uh, we um, come at this issue, uh, the, the four of us, uh, and, and, and Rai, of course, uh, also a combat veteran, uh, come at this issue from a personal lens. Uh, these numbers, when we talk about Afghan SIVs, translators, you know, 20,000 in the pipeline, these numbers have names and faces to us. These are our friends, these are our, our allies, these are people that we fought with and worked with shoulder to shoulder. And um, they're folks that we uh, shook uh, hands with and that we made promises. Uh, they're people who I can say without uh, a hint of hyperbole uh, that I might not be here today talking to you all 
uh, and having this conversation. If it hadn't been for the service, the sacrifice, the commitment uh, of our Afghan and Iraqi partners uh, who warned us of threats, uh, they, they were far more than just interpreters. They warned us of threats, helped us navigate challenging situations, uh, were on combat missions with us frequently. Uh, and uh, they, they served with us and helped bring Americans home alive. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and now we're in a position of having to return that favor and let, uh, provide to them the same level of protection that they provided to us uh, and keep our promise. But there's also a moral case to be made here uh, that you know if we want to uh, lead as a nation, if we want to be the beacon of light uh, well into the 21st century, that we have to lead with our morals and we have to protect people uh, who um, are with us in the pursuit of democracy and freedom uh, worldwide. Uh, and finally, there's a national security case here as well, that if uh, we are going to meet the threats of the 21st century, uh, we are strongest when we do it with friends and alliances. Uh, that is a distinguishing factor that distinguishes us from our adversaries is that we have alliances. But to have friends, you need to be a friend. And that's what this is about. Uh, so um, after the administration announced in April the, the end of the combat mission, which, of course, there's a variety of different views and perspectives in this group, uh, but regardless of your view on that decision, uh, this group came together immediately. We, we formed uh, the Honoring Our Promises Working Group. And we started uh, banging the drum and talking to anybody who would listen to us, holding press conferences, uh, giving interviews, uh, introducing legislation to say uh, that the, the evacuation of our Afghan partners and friends uh, and, and vulnerable uh, folks in Afghanistan should start right away. That we knew there was a threat that we would reach this point, that it would become too late, uh, that um, uh, we would have the the um, uh, we would lose the capability to conduct a non-combatant evacuation effectively. That's why we wanted to start it back in, in April. And you know, had that happened, uh, we would be in a very different position right now. We could have got tens of thousands of people out over the last uh, couple of months. Concurrent with that uh, effort, that campaign uh, to push for an earlier evacuation, we introduced legislation, the Hope Act, the Allies Act, to greatly speed up, expedite. Uh, and remove red tape and barriers to the Special Immigrant Visa Program, uh, which uh, now has uh, over 20,000 uh, uh, Afghan backlog, uh, and including their family members, uh, which you know is about a three and a half uh, a multiplier. We're talking about well over 90,000 Afghans who are in that pipeline. So to speed that up, but also double almost the number of uh, Special Immigrant Visas allocated by Congress. So we passed that with an overwhelming uh, bipartisan majority uh, just a few weeks ago. So now uh, we continue to push and call on the administration as a group uh, and as a uh, coalition uh, for a commitment to stay as long as necessary to evacuate not just American citizens, but our Afghan partners, to hold the airport, to extend that security beyond the perimeter of the airport so people can actually make it to the airport and work in collaboration with NGOs and aid groups who have very uh, strong vetting capacity to process as many Afghans as we can in the, in the weeks ahead. Uh, so I will stop there and uh, turn it back over to Rob. Thanks, Congressman Crow, and, um, and, and I think that's a, a really strong call to action to, to make a commitment to evacuate all of our Afghan interpreters and allies. And those allies include Afghans who worked for NGOs that were funded by U.S. government organizations and very high, uh, high uh, risk uh, categories, doing things like women's rights protections. Um, and next, I'd like to turn to, uh, to Congressman Kai Kahele. Uh, Kai is uh, the son of a Marine and a former um, Hawaiian uh, state senator. He is one of the first uh, Native Hawaiians elected to federal office, and he has uh, flown over 100 combat sorties, uh, some of which uh, were in the C-17 Globemasters, aka the Moose, which we are now reading about trying to get into uh, and, and, and getting into uh, Kabul, uh, airport. Uh, Congressman Kaheli, can you share uh, uh, some of your uh, per personal perspective, having served uh, in Afghanistan and, and, and uh, now on your first term uh, in Congress? You bet. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks so much for um, putting this together. And uh, it's great to see my colleagues. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Um, you know, like, like Bryce said, um, I'm a member of the Hawaii Air National Guard. My um, my, my skill set is as an aviator um, and uh, deployed to Afghanistan in 2005 in the C-130 first to uh, Bagram and then went back um, once checked out in the C-17. The majority of my uh, airlift missions have been um, in the C-17 Globemasters. So seeing pictures coming out of Kabul over the last 72 hours, uh, I've been 
deeply personal to me because you know I, I was one of those guys um, flying many of those missions uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Um, you know, for myself, you know, I spent most of Sunday like like um, probably most of you watching TV and 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 making phone calls and trying to reach out um, to other, in my case, colleagues and other friends that had served. Um, you know, really uh, upset and. Um, concerned over the rapidly deteriorating situation in Afghanistan and, and feeling helpless because, like Jason said, when the president announced in April that he would, in fact, uh, pull our troops out of Afghanistan and end the uh, combat operations there, we should have begun the uh, evacuation of you know thousands of American citizens and of Afghan allies um, to bring them uh, to the United States, and and that wasn't done. But on Sunday. You know, I didn't want to armchair quarterback this thing or play the blame game. I wanted to provide concrete solutions very, very quickly in how we could address that situation that was unfolding in Kabul. And that's not something, unfortunately, that, that you can do overnight. Uh, you know, we practice, and I'm still a uh, Hawaii Air National Guardsman at the 613th Air Operations Center at Hickam Air Force Base. I still serve in the National Guard. And we, we practice non-combatant uh, emergency uh, evacuations um, when we exercise evacuating the South Korean Peninsula and initiating neo-ops where we have white jets and gray jets and a, a huge operation to evacuate uh, people off the, the, the pen. Those same types of uh, applications needed to happen at Kabul and need to happen over the next few weeks. And that's a major major campaign that's going to have to uh, um, um, take place. And so having an arbitrary date of August 31st, not committing to um, making sure that every single Afghan interpreter and, and our friends and our allies have helped us um, in Afghanistan and provided a safe airfield for myself and my crew members to fly into time and time again. You know, that's something that um, I'm calling on this administration uh, to um, commit to and make sure that everyone gets out and nobody gets left behind. So thanks, Ryan, for having me here and happy to talk later about uh, specifics in regards to uh, Neo Airlift and um, how we should be uh, executing this out. Thanks, Congressman Kahele from Hawaii's uh, second district. Uh, lastly, we'll turn to uh, Congressman Peter Meyer, who is a freshman uh, member of the class with uh, Congressman Kahele. Peter is from Michigan's third district. Uh, is a good friend who previously served on with Honor Action's advisory board. He is a army was an army sergeant in the military intelligence, served in Iraq, and uh, and and has been in Afghanistan with uh, in various humanitarian uh, capacities before running for Congress. He's also a member of the Honoring Our Promises task force that that uh, Congressman Crow and Moulton from the Four Country Caucus uh, uh, founded. Uh, Congressman uh, Meyer. Uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, and over to you if you could share some of your perspective on what, what you're seeing based on your service. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, as you mentioned, when I was in Afghanistan, um, you know, I, I was in the humanitarian aid community, but specifically, uh, I performed conflict analysis and uh, safety advisory uh, operations for humanitarian aid workers. And, and sadly, um, what we're seeing is exactly what my job was. I mean, part of that was trying to coordinate evacuations, uh, obviously nothing on this scale, but I, I empathize with the uh, soldiers and Marines um, and airmen who are out there trying to get this job done. Uh, and, and, you know, Kai mentioned the, or you mentioned the C-17s that Kai used to flow, uh, fly. <clears throat> I, am, I am both incredibly, incredibly honored and, and proud of the men and women on the airlift mission. Um, uh, there is a, a silver lining of sadness that I don't feel I can rag on the Air Force anymore, that they have proven themselves to be such an amazing complement to the mission that's ongoing and such an essential one. So I will I will set aside uh, forevermore any jokes uh, at their expense out of inter-service uh, joviality. Uh, but, you know, the broader situation is incredibly frustrating. It's incredibly concerning. Um, what we've seen over the past week was what we feared. And, and this was one of the reasons why, as Jason mentioned, so many of us got together months ago in, in the spring uh, to try to expedite this SIV program, uh, to try to get more folks on planes, to clear away the backlog. Uh, and, and, and frustratingly, the situation devolved too rapidly 
um, for the many of the estimates. Uh, right now, um, and I think we speak in a unified voice on this, uh, we cannot turn our backs on the American citizens who are there and on our Afghan allies who are there as well. Uh, this is a large number of folks. Uh, we cannot have an arbitrary deadline. Uh, we need to be doing everything we can to get our allies to safety. Uh, as many of us on the call are, are receiving right now, and many Afghan veterans, members of Congress, um, you know, we have people who are outside of HKIA. You know, I am on WhatsApp conversations every day with a half dozen individuals who are trying to get into that base. Uh, you know, some who have paperwork, um, some who are in that pipeline, all of whom are moving house to house, spending a different night uh, at a different location because they are being followed by the Taliban, because they are receiving threats, because the Taliban are stopping by their homes. They're stopping by relatives' homes, asking where they are. And even though for the average American, this may be an abstraction, you know, I mean, these are people that we, we served with. These are people that we know. They are friends. Uh, they, are, they are individuals keeping us apprised on sometimes an hourly basis of what's going on. And, and I think I am, we need to do right by them. And I'm deeply concerned about what the long-term ramifications will be for our veterans community, uh, for civil military relations, and for our global standing. Right? We are where we are today. We cannot turn back the clock. We can't get in a time machine but we can decide how we carry forward and whether or not we honor the promises to those who risk their lives in support of our mission, or if we betray them and have a lasting stain on America's foreign intervention. So I'm, I'm proud to be part of this group. I look forward to the questions and just have to reiterate, we need to get this job done. We cannot give up. We've, we put a man on the moon. I think we can get American citizens and Afghan allies, you know, that are a couple of blocks away in Kabul. So over to you, Ray. Thanks, uh, Congressman Meyer. Much appreciated. We're going to turn now to uh, to Q and A. Uh, we have until eleven thirty. We're going to start off with a question from uh, With Honor's uh, co-founder uh, David Gergen, uh, known to many of you on the line, a former presidential advisor, uh, mentor to many of us, including myself when I was in graduate school. Um, and, uh, and David, thank you for following this issue closely and for all that you've done to help uh, get with honor off the ground and, uh, and support our work alongside the, the bipartisan veteran four country caucus that uh, each of the four members that we just heard of are active participants in. Uh, David, over to you, sir. Yeah, right. Thank you. And thank you, especially to the veterans who joined us today. Um, you're doing the Lord's work. And I hope you'll keep at it because there's, I think your pressure and your sort of moral suasion um, exceeds that of anybody else in this conversation, you know, in the national conversation. And that's why it's so important that you guys uh, keep talking. I, I have a current concern that I, I may be misreading this, but it seems to me that gradually the administration has been trying to split apart the question of getting the Americans home from the question of getting the Afghan allies home. Notably, in the last couple of days, uh, both uh, Millie and, and, and frankly, the president, uh, when we asked the question, are you trying to bring both out or is it the Americans? And, and it was left hanging in the air in a sort of an ominous way. <clears throat> and we, is it going to be reasonably possible to get these Af Af Afghans out if they're hiding in houses? How do we do that? I'm worried that the, the U.S. military is going to say, Millie has been saying, listen, that's beyond our capacity. We can do things at the airport. But we can't, we can't do things on the streets of Kabul it's just beyond our capacity. How do we think about this and how do we drive home and win the argument and then we get the right action uh, on these people who are the Afghan allies who are not able to get to the airport, who are going home discouraged and getting beaten up and all the rest, and they live in danger of their lives? Uh, that's one question. Second question, very quickly. Have you guys asked for an audience at the White House or the State Department to discuss your concerns. I think it could be very helpful to have a group of veterans representing different aspects of the veterans movement to sit down in the Roosevelt Room and talk about this and, and explain and try to get commitments um, from the people there. I just, and, and, and they can then tell you firsthand why it's so hard and it's better. But again, thank you, Ryan. Thank you all. Thanks, uh, David, for those that question. What, what I'd <laughs> propose is that we um, combine the response and, and uh, Congressman Crow, if, if you would be willing to take it, and then we'll jump into other questions from our, uh, our journalists that are on the line. Uh, Steve from the Bipartisan Policy Center will moderate the rest of the, the conversation. Congressman Crow. 
Yeah, thank you, Ryan, and thank you, David, uh, for that question and for your continued leadership and mentorship uh, in this space as well. Uh, I share your concern that there's a bifurcation of, short, of, of uh, sorts between the evacuation of American citizens and our Afghan partners. Now, all of us agree that um, chronologically, uh, the priority should be getting American citizens out. Uh, but this does not have to be uh, a binary choice. We don't have to choose between one or the other uh, because we have the capability and we have the resources uh, and uh, the talent uh, through our military and state department to actually do both. Uh, so I think it's a false choice to buy into the assumption that we have to do one or the other. Uh, of course, we have to give the priority uh, to our, our citizens and we will always do that. Um, so I do share that concern and I've been trying to secure a commitment from the administration uh, to continue uh, the evacuation operation so long as necessary to get our Afghan partners out, uh, including, to, including our American citizens. I think that is... Uh, uh, extremely important to say. And I, I know all of us on the call have been trying to secure that commitment as well. And with regard to engagement, and I've been uh, um, in regular communication with uh, senior White House officials, with members of the National Security Council uh, and, uh, and State Department and others, uh, and um, continue to push that case uh, both personally and publicly in those communications. Uh, we are, are going to be receiving a, a briefing today, an open briefing uh, by Secretaries Blinken and Austin. Uh, and uh, DNI Haynes uh, and, and Chairman Milley. Uh, there's going to be a classified briefing, uh, all member briefing in person uh, next week on Tuesday. And then I'm a member of the Intelligence Committee. We're actually going to have a, a briefing uh, and uh, a, a slash hearing on Monday uh, by members of the intelligence community as well. Uh, I, what I do want to make sure we do, though, is that we're not um, uh, asking for uh, so much in terms of in person meetings and hearings over the next week or two that. We're distracting or taking away from their bandwidth to conduct this mission because uh, it obviously takes a lot of effort for them to prepare for uh, these uh, these congressional engagements. So I want to do oversight and um, I do enough, uh, but not too much that we are uh, detracting from their ability to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Congressman and Ryan, I'm going to come back to you uh, at the end for some closing but a lot of questions coming in from John Hogan, and I'm going to direct this question to Congressman Kaheli. And, and Congressman, the question is, President Trump's Taliban uh, agreement, did that in any way contribute to the current situation that we are seeing unfolding over the last 10 days? Congressman Kaheli. Thanks, Steve, for the question. You know, you know President Trump uh, and, uh, and Mike Pompeo at the time, you know, they decided to meet with the Taliban and, and, and have... Um, conversations uh, with the Taliban and came to an agreement to uh, withdraw troops from Afghanistan by the 31st of May. You know, that was something that was done by this previous administration. And, um, you know, the Biden administration, when they came into office, had a decision um, because the Trump administration had scaled down uh, troops in combat operations in Afghanistan. And there was this truce at the time, you know, the president had a, had a choice, either um, um, go back on that uh, promise that uh, the Trump administration had made and then you know, resume combat operations and uh, with a ground force incapable to do that and you would have to surge and bring more troops in or bring our troops home and, and end combat operations. I fully supported President uh, Biden's uh, decision to do that. But I think what was frustrating for myself and many others was once that decision was made, we had months to start pulling out of uh, Afghanistan and uh, and start those very, very difficult, complex airlift operations as we would scale, uh, scale down Afghanistan. So, um, you know, I, I think the president, I, I, not I think, I know President Biden made the right call. And look, you know, for, for myself, you know, I've been now in the uh, uh, serving the armed forces for 20 years, all but eight months of my entire 20 year career, we've been at war. Um, and I, you know, deployed in 2005, a long, long time ago. And so bringing this war to an end is something we, we needed to do as, as a nation. But at the same time, how we've handled the um, uh, evacuation in the last few months, I just feel there's a, there's a huge disconnect about what's happening on the ground right now and what can happen uh, if we're able to move uh, quickly and, and decisively. Congressman, a very quick follow-up. How bad are the optics? I mean, you know, I don't think it can get any worse than, uh, you know, an entire airfield of uh, Af 
uh, Afghans uh, running over um, and around a taxi in C-17 uh, with, um, uh, you know, Afghans hanging to the wheel wells of the C-17 and then that aircraft taking off and having Afghans uh, fall to their death. That's, I just can't uh, imagine what that C-17 crew was, uh, was going through. You know, we're seeing images coming out of Kabul uh, where we have um, desperate Afghan parents handing um, newborns, practically, and infants to U.S. soldiers on the other side of the fence. And, and that's how desperate the situation is there right now. And, and we, need, uh, we need leadership and, and we need clear, uh, swift decisions. And, and this, this is no time for armchair quarterbacking and courses of action. It's, it's, it's time to move. And, uh, you know, we're here to support this administration to do that. But we, we need, we need uh, quick decisions by this administration. Congressman Meyer, this is coming from CBS. You are an expert in intelligence, having served in Afghanistan as an Army intelligence officer. The question is, a lot of finger pointing between the intelligence community, the Pentagon, the State Department, and the White House. Who's to blame? The question of who's to blame, um, we really need to identify which is the problem that we're trying to assess the blame, right? Because uh, there is the, the issue of the surprise of the speed of the collapse of the Afghan government, the Afghan military during the course of this, this withdrawal. Uh, there's the broader question on just our ability to negotiate and establish rapport uh, with the Taliban and their intentions. Uh, and then there's the much broader, the 40,000 foot view, just the, the operational and strategic failures that have underpinned our post 9-11 conflicts. Um, everyone shares blame here. Um, you know, the state, DOD, the intelligence community, um, they have their share. Congress, having delegated and, and essentially um, washed its hands of its war powers, has a share. Uh, the media and the public uh, for losing interest and not holding our politicians to account uh, to ensure there's accountability over their share. Uh, right now, I'm very concerned. If we look at the specific level, I'm very concerned that either the intelligence community did not pick up on media uh, uh, mid-level negotiations and accommodations that were made between the Taliban and um, you know, provincial governors, uh, regional power brokers, um, you know, district chiefs of police, district governors, you know, those uh, underpinning the Afghan government and Afghan national security forces that uh, disappeared overnight. Either they hadn't anticipated that degree, had overassessed uh, their strength, or their warnings were not heeded. And obviously, even internally within the administration, there's a lot of finger pointing going on. Um, but I come back to that overarching point of there will be plenty of time for recriminations. I am deeply frustrated and have certainly made my own um, you know, comments on who I think owes fault for how we arrived at this situation. But we need to make sure we get all American citizens and our Afghan allies out. The, Jul the August 31st deadline is contributing to the chaos and the panic at the airport. Because you have Afghans who think that they have 10 days to get out of this country or that door is closing forever. That's why we're seeing crowds. That's why we're seeing chaos, right? We have created a deadline where we have agreed to a deadline imposed by the Taliban. As a result, we are forcing the situation to be more chaotic, to be more tense, and to be more dangerous and volatile than it needs to be. And, and I agree with Kai. I mean, we need strong, clear leadership on, on what our plans are. Um, and I, I hope we see that from President Biden soon, uh, because if not, I fear the situation on the ground will only get worse. And again, uh, no amount of, of intelligence preparation can tell you how a chaotic situation is going to unfold. I mean, once once that collapse begins, um, you know, it, it, it spirals in any potential direction. And I also fear that we haven't seen the worst, that the, the horrific images of uh, children falling from um, the young man, the young uh, teenager who fell from that C-17 and died, um, the, the, the babies being passed to their parents. I mean, this is tragic. This is heartbreaking. Uh, but there are plenty of ways in which this could get far worse, far quickly. Congressman Crow, you're a member of the House Intelligence and the House Armed Services Committee. And this is from Sarah Weyer of the LA Times. And the question essentially is, how do you balance the tensions and the responsibilities as a member of your party versus the background you have as a veteran and somebody who served in the region? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, there, there's no balance uh, that I think has to be uh, done there. I mean, I, I am an American first and foremost. I'm somebody who has taken an oath 
That oath is not to a political party. That oath is to the Constitution and to the United States of America. Uh, and, and that's what guides my work. Uh, and I think that's uh, been abundantly clear in, in, in our work uh, together with this group in the last four months that, um, you know, uh, if there's something that's going wrong or not well, we're going to say it uh, and we're going to try to try to fix it and do what needs to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I will say as a member of the intelligence and the, the um, uh, Armed Services Committee, I'm one of the few members that sit on both of those and obviously have a, a combat background in addition to that. Uh, and um, I believe I'm the only, uh, uh, at least Democrat combat veteran uh, on uh, that, that committee, the Intelligence Committee. I, you know, I couldn't agree more with what Peter just said in terms of how we look at this intelligence assessment. And I think it's extremely important right now that uh, people use the right language and uh, they are clear in what they're saying and they're not saying. Because I've been hearing a lot of people toss around this term intelligence failure, that, oh, there's been an intelligence failure. And if somebody is saying that, they don't know what they're talking about because it's too early to say whether that is true. Uh, we just don't know that. And, and I think I have access to enough information to make that assessment because there's multiple things going on here. There's the gathering of intelligence and then the assessment of that intelligence to pass through our policymakers and decision makers. Then there are those policy decisions, number two. And then there's operational and contingency planning, in this case uh, with the, the State Department and the Department of Defense. Now, I think what we will see is across that spectrum that there were things that could have been done, done better, that there may have been failings at all three of those levels. Uh, but, um, you know, we have to be really careful that when we're dealing with folks who are working very hard uh, in many instances in, in the intelligence community or DOD and state, you know, the rank and file folks that are doing a, a great job, uh, that we aren't throwing people under the bus before we fully understand what's happening. And when we're, we are in the mix right now, we are in the middle of that mission. And uh, we will have the, the time, as my colleagues have said, to take that step back and conduct that assessment and do those after action reviews uh, in a deliberate and methodical way. Uh, but that time uh, is not yet arrived because we are still trying to accomplish the mission and save tens of thousands of lives. Congressman Meyer, you paid tribute to your Republican colleague, Don Bacon, uh, who joined us in the first half of this conversation uh, as an Air Force veteran. But one of the questions coming from not only one of our senior vice presidents, Bill Hoagland, but also from the Washington Times that it, uh, is a similar question. It, 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 why is it just the Kabul airport? Why can't other airports in Afghanistan be used for the evacuation of those who want to leave the country? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the uh, the consolidation at Kabul airport, there's a couple of different reasons why. I mean, once we shut down Bagram, which I think there's a broad consensus in hindsight, you know, if we knew then what we know now, we wouldn't have done that. But uh, as we were moving towards the, the Doha uh, negotiations, that was part of that retrograde operation. Um, you know, we have limitations at HKIA. Right. There's one runway. Um, it's in a relatively dense urban area. Um, it has a, a, a more defensible perimeter because it's a smaller footprint than a sprawling base like Bagram. Uh, but that smaller footprint also means it's easier uh, to be encircled and there's fewer ways to potentially get somebody to a more isolated location. Um, and that's where you're seeing those crushes in those crowds. So I'm... Um, you know, I, I flew out of, uh, I, I lived in Kandahar City for nine months, uh, right? I flew out of that civilian side airport. I flew out of Kabul airport probably two dozen times going to going to Herat and going to Kandahar, flying out of the country. Um, you know, these, we haven't yet seen civilian flights resume. Uh, the uh, one ideal scenario would be to have, uh, if it's not the United States, have some degree of international intervention, whether it's the United Nations or another entity uh, to provide stability, both for the Afghan people, but especially so we can have American citizens make their way to those airports um, and, and consolidate either externally or domestically. I hope these are conversations that are going on. I'm not confident that they are, uh, but we clearly need to have a plan for folks who are outside of Kabul. Right now there isn't. Um, I hope it's underway, but we need to ensure that that happens or else we'll have no chance of, of effectively and in the short term consolidating and getting to safety individuals who are not yet in Kabul. And Congressman Crow, this is from one of the participants looking at the situation in Afghanistan and wondering whether China could use this moment as a power grab as we withdraw from Kabul and elsewhere in Afghanistan. Congressman Crow. Yeah, I think it's going to be more complicated than that. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, we're opening the door to China. That's not necessarily the case. Um, uh, the, 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 um, there is no conclusion, foregone conclusion, that the Taliban is going to be uh, closer to China than anybody else. Uh, and of course, there are 
border concerns that China has, uh, security concerns, uh, you know, Ar Iran, uh, the stands, Pakistan, uh, Russia, China, the people who are immediately adjacent to uh, Afghanistan, um, have an interest in having security and stability in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and that uh, obviously is not going to be achieved anytime in the near future under Taliban rule. So I think the situation is actually more complicated and complex for China and others than it was a week ago. Uh, and, and I think um, uh, it's, it's certainly not uh, open and shut that they're going to come out of this better uh, or worse than anybody else. Congressman Kelly, a couple of questions from Politico and TheHill.com, wondering whether or not the president in the White House has been for, on the forefront in all of this. Have they tried to stay ahead of the story, or was the president himself caught flat-footed? Um, you know, again, I, I'm not one here to, uh, you know, point fingers or, or, or um, you know, cast blame on the administration. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on and have been since Sunday on providing um, uh, solutions to, you know, that this administration can, can execute on. And so, you know, I think, again, I think it's been, you've heard it throughout this entire um, conversation that uh, the time for um, um, evaluating decisions made by this administration, that, that that's going to happen. I think everyone on this call, including um, my colleagues, are focused on what, what we can do now and what we can do now to get these um, uh, Afghans out. And we put ourselves in an, uh, really in an untenable situation where we got to sort it out later. You know, we need to move as many Afghans uh, uh, and our assets out of country, move them to locations where we can, we can, we can figure this out. You know, we've been calling for um, uh, the, the move of thousands of our Afghan partners to bases like Anderson Air Force Base uh, at the Pacific Island Territory of Guam, which we've done in the past um, as we um, ended the Vietnam War. You know, we've been calling for that for months now. So at this point, we put ourselves in a situation where we just need to move quickly. We need to sort the paperwork out later. And uh, we need to move people to American bases uh, and, our, and bases of our allies where we can um, then figure this out, um, especially uh, with this August 31st date that's that's hanging over us, which is which is leading to a panicked uh, situation. Go, going back to what you said earlier, Steve, about uh, Bagram. You know, Bagram's uh, about an hour and a half away, um, and and with the major population center in Kabul and where everyone is, it might be it, it would, it's probably more dangerous to have people um, flow to Bagram. Uh, we've already left Bagram as well. And standing up uh, airlift operations in both Kabul and Bagram uh, is probably going to be too difficult um, for us now at this point. I think everything has to be concentrated uh, at Kabul. Congressman Meyer, did you want to respond to the president's response over the last week with the situation in Afghanistan? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm still frustrated that we're not seeing the clarity that I think we need. Um, you know, I, I, I understand on a human level his defensiveness, uh, though so much of that was around the decision of withdrawal rather than the execution. And as many have said, there are a variety of opinions on whether or not to withdraw, um, but, you know, not a lot of uh, of discrepancy that this withdrawal has not been executed in the way that it could have been. Um, but again, we need clarity around that deadline. Um, you know, within the recent interview with George Stephanopoulos, he it had to be dragged out. I mean, this would be something that, uh, specifically, it had to be dragged out that American citizens, you know, that the DOD was looking at continuing to try to help them out after August 31st. Clarity clear communications here would go a very long way to reestablishing confidence and to getting us to the point where we, again, are not dealing with hordes of crowds who think the clock is ticking, that their opportunity to save their own lives is ticking. Um, that is in hindering this operation because of the lack of clarity on where we are going. And Congressman Meyer, I'm going to stay with you because I'm going to distill a single question from a lot of people who have been weighing in, and that is the debate within your own party on those Afghan refugees coming to America. What is your overall sense and your view of the debate within the GOP, some saying they shouldn't come to the U.S.? 
I think there's a pretty big misconception of what population we're talking about here. Um, you know, the, the term refugee is being used in a general sense. Um, uh, special immigrant visa holders are, are not refugees in the sense of, of random individuals, right? The groups that we are bringing over are people who are known to the U.S., many of whom are incredibly highly vetted, have worked for the U.S. military or U.S. government agencies or U.S. nonprofits or media groups. Uh, these are folks who uh, overwhelmingly speak fluent English, um, have been, again, working with the United States for years. And, and I know there's been some confusion around, you know, this, um, there are allegations that the Biden administration was not prioritizing Americans. Uh, that was not the case. Americans citizens have always been the priority. Uh, the challenge was there were some initial moments where they're saying, we're only going to put American citizens on flights. What you're doing is you're effectively breaking up families when you do that. There's a lot of family groups coming where you might have um, a parent who is an American citizen. The spouse might be a green card holder. Uh, the children's may have uh, visas. Uh, so you have these blended status family units, and it's unconscionable, uh, and this was some of the bureaucratic interpretation, to be splitting up families as a result. We've seen this confusion at the gates. Uh, we've seen it internally. We've seen it in the media. So I do not, I have not yet heard any strong uh, arguments against bringing our interpreters here. Uh, the consensus within the veterans community is passionate, emotional, and overwhelming. There are always going to be bad faith takes in, in many areas and room for misconception. But uh, I go back to the fact that more members of Congress, more Republicans voted to bring our interpreters over here to support the SIV program, then voted to award congressional medals to the Capitol Police, right? I mean, this was overwhelmingly bipartisan, a strong show from the to the administration that we care about this issue deeply and passionately. And, and if the president is spending more time listening to what some fringe voices say uh, than to what the veterans community is saying, it's deeply troubling. Congressman Crow, this question, your biggest concern in the short term, the next three to six months with regard to Afghanistan, what worries you the most? Uh, it's very simple, Steve. It's that uh, we leave behind tens of thousands of Afghan partners and their families, people that fought with us, that served with us, that relied on our promises. And that becomes a, um, a moral stain in the history of this nation. Uh, the, we, we are at a decision point right now uh, you know, I think we've, we've uh, said over and over again on this call and over the last couple of weeks and maybe the last couple of days that we're going to have time to debate the missteps of the last two decades uh, and missed opportunities and the things that went wrong and uh, how we should have done it better uh, and, and certainly debate um, the decision to withdraw. Uh, but we are here now. Uh, we have tens of thousands of people that are relying on us over the next couple of days and weeks to save their lives. Uh, and we just have to make a decision. We're going to make a decision of how uh, we're going to proceed and uh, how we will be viewed in history and, and the legacy of, of our leadership right now. And, and I am very clear, and I want that decision to be that we are going to be decisive and say that these are our friends, these are our partners, these are people that relied on our promises, that the American handshake matters, and we will bring you to safety. And we will bring you here, and you're going to be amazing Americans, and we will look back on this for decades to come and say this was uh, one of our better moments that came out of one of our more challenging moments. Uh, and, and that's a decision that we can make uh, today. Uh, and I'm afraid you know, that, that we may not make that decision decisively. Uh, and, and it would be a mistake uh, to leave those folks behind. Congressman Kaheli, uh, everyone on this conversation has a very unique background to the region of Iraq and Afghanistan, but you personally, and Rai had asked me to pose this question to you as somebody who has flown into Kabul, Afghanistan on a C-17. What's that like? Thanks for the question, Steve. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a mission that, uh, you know, you don't take lightly and, and one that you prepare for. You know, as Air Force pilots, uh, we, we train for years for missions like this. Um, you know, you're in charge as a mission commander, which I was, of a you know, almost $300 million aircraft, you have an entire crew, you have, uh, uh, your passengers are on board, you're coming into a, a hostile area and a hostile environment um, where you don't know uh, what that austere airfield is going to look like, but you, you, you know, you do your best to, um, uh, 
um, get as much intelligence reports and pre-flight briefings before you make that mission. Uh, it depends on what the uh, threat at the airfield is. Um, it might require a high penetration descent uh, to get into Kabul, um, depending on if there are small arms fires or uh, man pads uh, or any types of uh, surface air missile systems with, within the uh, airfield area. Um, but make no mistake, you know, when that crew is um, entering Afghanistan airspace, uh, they are uh, fully equipping themselves for that approach and arrival into the airfield. Um, there's pre-briefings that are done in flight before they enter the airspace. And as they um, conduct that descent and that arrival into uh, Kabul, uh, it's all hands on deck. Uh, and, and the uh, unknowns are what that airfield is going to look like when you land. The condition of the airfield, uh, whether that airfield is secure, uh, which is something that I had called for immediately on, on Sunday, was the mobilization of the 82nd Airborne and any type of additional military forces needed to secure that airfield. The most important thing for an, uh, an aircraft and their air crew is that the airfield is 100% secure. And, and clearly, uh, it, it has not been uh, over the last few days. Um, so, um, you know, as, as a, uh, um, a crew, you know, we work together on the ground. We have no idea what to expect. You know, the pictures I saw coming out of uh, Afghanistan where you have 600, 700 people crammed into a C-17. They don't teach you that, Steve, at the schoolhouse at Altus Air Force Base. They don't, that, that's not found uh, operational specifics and, and how to floor load 700 people on a C-17. Um, they don't teach you that. that. That's real time, but that's what the United States Air Force does. And, and we get the mission done. And, you know, my, uh, my kudos to the air crew, the load masters in the back, uh, the crew chiefs in the back that have to deal with that situation. Um, you know, my hat's off to them because I know exactly uh, what they're going through right now. And Congressman Meyer, as you see the images in Afghanistan this week, you spent time on the ground as an intelligence officer. What's in the back of your mind? What are your memories of what you went through as you see this unfold now? I mean, I see in those crowds, um, I mean, some of the same people that I relied on pr to provide for my safety, um, but I also see in those crowds tremendous danger, right? The, the longer we keep this volatile situation up, the greater the risk that something spins wildly out of control, um, the more that DOD and state are still in a reactive mode, uh, you know, and, and they should be focused on this immediate task. This is an all hands on deck task but we also may be missing uh, some of the things we need to be doing that in two weeks or four weeks, we look back and say, oh, we, we never anticipated this consequence, right? We never were had this contingency mapped out. Um, whether that means trying to establish alternative means of getting individuals who are outside of Kabul to Kabul or, or out of the country or any number of different things that we should be thinking about right now. So I'm concerned about um, our, our capacity. I'm concerned that we are not moving with the speed that we need to be moving. I'm concerned that with State Department in the lead, and I have a lot of respect um, for some of my friends at State Department, but they are not an organization that reacts well uh, in exigent circumstances. Right? So we really need to be focusing on uh, having a very clear-cut mission, and that's where, again, I come down to clear guidance from the top unequivocal so that everyone knows what the commander's intent is and can execute along those lines. There is no replacing clarity of mission uh, for the consistency of the effort. A final point for all of you, and then I'm going to turn back to Rai Barkat for his uh, final comments. And again, on behalf of the Bipartisan Policy Center, our thanks to With Honor Action that put this program together in partnership with us. We have a lot of reporters on this, uh, this conversation. And so Congressman Crow, I'm going to begin with you, and I know you've all said the time now is not for finger pointing, but give us a sense of what we can expect in the weeks ahead as Congress looks into the events in Afghanistan. As the hearings get underway, they'll be on C-SPAN and elsewhere next week. Uh, what are you looking for? What questions remain unanswered? What can these reporters expect in the weeks ahead on Capitol Hill? Yeah, thanks, Steve. And, and I want to um, end by thanking again with Honor Action, uh, Ry Barcott and David Bergen and the Bipartisan Policy Center for hosting this discussion. Uh, you know, it's not often that we actually get to take the deep dive and actually have a, a, a dispassionate discussion about facts and, and policy. So it's a great opportunity uh, on, um, uh, you know, on this front and on this issue. Um, so you know, the bottom line is we have to look at this uh, uh, 
chronologically in a triage and uh, the sole focus needs to be right now on securing a commitment from the administration not to hold to an end of month deadline. Number one, securing the airport uh, and extending the perimeter out for a lot of people to get to the airport uh, and working more closely with our aid groups and NGOs to have a parallel evacuation of SIVs, American citizens, uh, and our other partners in Afghanistan. Uh, so that's number one, and that's gonna be the next couple of weeks, and it should be the next couple of weeks, uh, the time for finger pointing uh, and, and oversight, and uh, this robust debate will come, uh, but it's not right now. Uh, uh, in uh, our oversight, our call today with uh, administration leadership, our um, closed hearings and open hearings next week, uh, all of that should be geared at what uh, is happening on the ground and how we do it better. Uh, then, of course, we will convert to our oversight. We will do what Congress is supposed to do, uh, and that is be an independent and separate branch that looks at uh, what happened and uh, if there are things that went wrong, what we have to do to fix them, uh, and how we have to make sure that they never happen again. Uh, and then third, longer term, uh, we are going to have uh, you know, tens of thousands uh, of Afghans, I hope, uh, that will be evacuated and saved that will be coming to America. These are people that have already proven their patriotism and commitment to our country. They're gonna be amazing Americans, but they're gonna need our support. Uh, so we're gonna, as a group, not, not only um, uh, four country caucus and um, all the other bipartisan caucuses that we have uh, in, in the working group, honoring our promises working group, we're gonna be looking at legislation that's necessary to streamline that process, the visa process, uh, to make sure that they're getting the transition support, the resettlement support they need to thrive and succeed in America. And that's going to be a longer term effort. And it's one that's going to require uh, our attention and focus for, for years to come. Congressman Meyer, you're on House Homeland Security and Foreign Affairs. What can we expect? What are your looming questions as we move ahead? Uh, obviously, the looming question will be, you know, how did we get this so wrong? Um, how did we not have you know, that contingency in place. Uh, but I do think we need to be looking at also the much broader picture, right? I mean, the conclusion of this conflict, if we are looking at the conclusion right now, um, this marks 20 years of our post 9-11 conflicts. We need to be looking at the congressional war powers. We need to be looking at how the legislative branch receives and analyzes intelligence. I strongly believe we need an independent intelligence analysis bureau, similar to the Congressional Budget Office, uh, so that there's room for dissenting opinions and, and less room for uh, manipulation of analytical conclusions by any executive. Uh, I, I think we need to also be taking that broader look at how uh, our diplomatic corps, at how the State Department, at how the Department of Defense, and how the intelligence community, how they are, are provided and, and held to account for longer term strategic priorities. This has been a, a signature feature of our post 9-11 conflicts, the sense of mission creep, of drift, the, the self-licking ice cream cone, just the momentum and the perpetuity that these conflicts have created uh, without any real uh, solid answer of what are we doing there? What is the mission and what does what victory look like? So I think we need to be unsparing uh, and, and unrestrained in terms of where, uh, how wide we open the aperture there. Um, but again, I, I think that this is, you know, not just the the the, the botched withdrawal and, and the chaos that we've seen unfold, but really this puts a fine point on the entirety of our, our conflict in Afghanistan, uh, and in many ways also wraps in some of the challenges we saw and the failures in our conflict in Iraq. And finally, Congressman Kahela, you get the award for joining us at the earliest hour in Hawaii. So we thank you for getting up so early. But the same question to you, moving ahead. You're a member of the House Armed Services Committee. What questions do you need answered? And as these reporters prepare next week, what can they expect? Well, we're going to start uh, armed ser uh, hearings on the Armed Services Committee next week. And uh, they'll, they'll be asking uh, a lot of those questions that uh, both of my colleagues have, have mentioned and to um, take a look at uh, what went wrong, uh, what, what, you know, decisions were made uh, by previous administrations, this current administration to put us in this situation that we're in now. Um, uh, and I think you're going to see members of Congress like myself and my colleagues focus on the situation at hand. Uh, the suggestion by David um, for a small group of us to meet uh, with the White House um, uh, is, is, I think, a great one. And that's, that's what I'm going to um, work with my colleagues um, to see if we can put together a uh, lead on. At the end of the day, you know, uh, Steve, the United States, uh, we have a moral obligation uh, to be a defender of human rights. You know, we need to make sure every Afghan 
uh, ally that helped us, that worked alongside uh, with us, uh, that are friends uh, to us, get out of Afghanistan, or, or they're going to die. Uh, the Taliban are ruthless, uh, and, and when we leave, uh, it's going to be a much different country uh, than it is now. And, and the United States um, uh, has to set an example um, so that other countries um, both, you know, will work with us and that, uh, you know, they can trust us and that we're going to live up to our obligations. And if we don't do that, failure to do that, Steve, I really believe we'll have long-term consequences uh, that are going to be too difficult to overcome uh, in future conflicts. And so this is a time where America needs to lead. And um, we're going to be coming back to Congress on Monday to uh, help this administration do that. A conversation with four members of Congress, two Democrats, two Republicans, all veterans. Congressman Kaheli is joining us from Hawaii, a Democrat from that state's second district. We thank you for being with us. Congressman Peter Meyer, who's joining us from Michigan's third congressional district, a Republican. And Congressman Jason Crow from the sixth congressional district in Colorado, Democrat. We also want to thank Congressman Don Bacon, who joined us in the first half of the program, Republican from Nebraska's second congressional district. So, gentlemen, thank you for being with us. We thank you for your service. I want to turn it back to Rye Barcott, who is our co-sponsor with this conversation. Rye. Steve, thank you. Uh, thank you, Congressman, four members of the bipartisan all-veteran four-country caucus that with honor action works alongside. This is a critical issue, as we've heard. We are staying on it. Please um, follow uh, with honor action and Congressman Crow's uh, 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 website and social media for updates on the Honoring Our Promises Task Force. There will be a another press conference at the House Triangle by the Four Country Caucus uh, on Monday at 5.30. They'll be announcing a letter to the President uh, that includes some of the content that we heard here today. I also just want to mention that we have hundreds of people across the country who are joining this call who are concerned citizens. And I really would like to encourage you to uh, do whatever you can to send one simple message. And that is that the president needs to call for all an evacuation of all of our Afghan interpreters and allies. The call has been made by the president to evacuate all American citizens. It has not been made for our Afghan allies. It's, this is an urgent and chaotic situation. And that's something that you can do to help. And lastly, I'd like to thank the press, members of the press who joined for this call, you are playing a critical role both in this uh, this situation and uh, and many others in our, in our democracy. Thank you all again.